Good evening. My name is Susan Elberger. I'm a first-term state representative. Tonight, we're presenting the second of two forums about issues important to Nashua. Last week, the forum focused on women's health and reproductive justice in New Hampshire, presented by State Representative Paige Boschman from Ward 4, and Family Issues, Education, Certification, and the Resources Available to You, presented by State Representative Heather Raymond from Ward 1. The recording of that forum is available through the Nashua Public Television YouTube channel. This forum is also being recorded and will be available there in a few days. Tonight we're going to talk about New Hampshire finances, where the money comes from, where it goes, and why our property taxes are so high. There's a saying that money makes the world go round. It certainly is the main means of getting the things we need and want, whether food, health care, housing, or clothing. It's also the way we educate our children, keep ourselves and our property safe, ensure that our homes and businesses don't burn down, plow our streets when it snows, and have our trash collected. We accomplish these by paying taxes, which Merriam-Webster defines as a charge usually of money imposed by authority on persons or property for public purposes. Most of us don't like paying them, and at the same time, we want the services they provide. I feel very privileged to introduce the Honorable Cindy Rosenwald, State Senator for District 13, comprising Nashua Awards 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Cindy is serving in her third term in the New Hampshire Senate after seven terms in the House of Representatives. She's the Deputy Democratic Leader, a position she also held in the House. She sits on the Finance and Ways and Means Committee. Uh, she was previously chair of the House Health, Human Services, and Elderly Affairs Committee. A Nashua resident for 35 years, Cindy has a bachelor's degree from Harvard College and a master's degree from Revere University. She and her husband, Peter Klementovich, have two children and two grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> I represent Nashua Ward 1 in my first term and serve on the House Ways and Means Committee. By the way, I wasn't sure exactly what Ways and Means did compared to finance until I was there and found out that Ways and Means figures out where the money is coming from and then finance gets to figure out how it's going to get spent, for those of you who weren't quite aware. Um, I previously served on the school committee in Lexington, Massachusetts and as an elected member of town meeting in Lexington and Arlington, Massachusetts. I have a bachelor's degree in sociology and a master's degree in counseling and personnel services from the State University of New York in Albany. Senator Rosenwald will discuss the overall picture of state finances and I'll follow with a focus on education funding. There will be time for questions following each presentation. Senator Rosenwald. Well, I'm thrilled to be here and um, thank you for setting this up. I should say that back before I was elected in 2004, Ways and Means and Finance was combined. Mm. There was one committee that did both the raising of the money and the spending of it, but it's been split into two. Probably to, to help uh, let them get some sleep. I think. You know, the budget sort of got more complicated, but um, probably, so I have these pie charts that came around. Um, New Hampshire actually has, has two budgets, but I'm only gonna talk about the operating budget, not the capital budget. The capital budget is about 120 or so million dollars a year where we fund capital projects. For example, if um, Nashua Community College wants to build more science labs, that's where that funding would come from, and that's bonded, that's bonded funding. But our operating budget is done on a two-year basis, and it um, currently, the budget we're in, which started July 1st, and will end June 30th, 2025, 
is a $15 billion budget over two years. And um, this nice pie chart shows you where most of the money goes. And you can see that the biggest slice of the pie is for health programs and social services. The biggest of those programs is our state's Medicaid program, which serves low-income children, people with um, developmental disabilities, and frail elderly. And New Hampshire is one of the majority of states that took advantage of the provision of the Affordable Care Act to expand Medicaid to adults between the ages of 19 and 64 who were not otherwise eligible but are quite low income. And that's been really successful, not only for the health of those 50,000 people who are covered, but it's literally been a lifeline for our state's hospitals who are forced to treat patients even when those patients don't have insurance or money to pay their bills. So that's been really good. So Medicaid's the biggest program. Um, also in there is temporary assistance to needy families, which used to be known as welfare. And um, public health, which is really important. And this, so the second biggest slice of pie is public education. And that is 22% of the spending. I know it's so dim in here, it's hard to, it's hard to see. Um, then transportation is how we get our roads plowed. Um, that's really important for safety, but also for the conduct of, of commerce, really. I mean, our businesses need to move their services and goods around the state. Resource protection is basically environmental services. Um, category two, over on the right, administration of justice and public protection is the judicial branch, but also the Department of Justice. And um, then the last one is general government, and that's everything else. So that's, for example, the Secretary of State's office, the Office of Professional Licensing and Certification. Everything that's not in one of these other things, like lottery is in here. So on my second slide is where the money comes from for this $15 billion budget. And you will see that most of it is federal funds. Um, that is the biggest slice of the pie, it is 32% almost of our two-year budget is federal funding. After that, um, that is the general fund. And a number of sources go into the general fund. Some of it is business taxes. Some of it is the interest and dividends tax. Some of it is, um, what am I missing? Lottery. Um, it's, well, some charitable gambling, not, not the lottery itself, but the rest of what goes into lottery is general fund money, the tobacco tax money, liquor funds, you know, the state controls all the liquor sales. And so that's a really important slice. But um, I'll, I'll, you'll see 
in this second handout that we've been making a huge amount of interest on the state's cash reserves the last couple of years. We've gotten like $2 billion of federal relief funds. We are spending them, but not quickly. And interest rates have gone up, so that revenue source has performed incredibly well. Uh, the highway fund is mostly funded by your gas tax. And the sweepstakes fund is self-explanatory. The education trust fund is funded by several different sources, you know, principally, I think, the business taxes. However, if there is a deficit in that fund, it must be made up by the general fund. So it is a separate fund, but it's not walled off. And the turnpike fund is from our tolls um, on the Everett and the Spalding Turnpike. So that is where we get the $15 billion. I also should say that we don't put all of the federal funds into the budget. A lot of them can be accepted by the 10-person fiscal committee, which meets every month. And so there was a decision made not to put them in the budget because it would just make the budget look bigger, but it adds up to hundreds of millions of dollars a year of federal funds. So the last page on the first handout is just the surplus statement. And I only wanted to show it to you uh, so that if you look at the last box in the furthest right-hand column, you'll see that our rainy day fund at the end of the fiscal year, we started July 1st, will be our plan is for it to be $231 million. That's the highest it's ever been. It's reasonably healthy. The bond, the bond rating agencies like states to have a healthy rainy day fund. And um, during the Great Recession of 2009, we took almost all of the money out of the rainy day fund. I think we ended up with $9 million left. And we have, we've built it back up since. So um, we're in good shape right now. Um, but I wanna show you the September monthly revenue focus. This is something that is, comes out every month you can find it online, and um, it um, shows you exactly where we are on every revenue source. And um, if you look at the current month, and this is just one month, you'll see that the business taxes were below goal by over $33 million, which is not good news, that's our biggest revenue source. Ha about half of it goes to education funding. And so we're um, concerned about that. The meals and rooms tax, which is hotels, restaurants, if you buy prepared food at a grocery store and you pay that tax, and also car rentals, is performing Okay, just about on plan. Liquor sales have been missing goal, which is, I think, a combination of two things. One, there is competition from a private company that locates stores just over the Massachusetts border that's very competitive with us on price. And 
the liquor commissioner believes that young people are drinking less. And he has theories about what they're doing instead. <laughs> but th that's concerning because we generate something like $150 million a year from alcohol sales. Uh, the tobacco tax is totally down the tubes. It, um, last fiscal year, I think we missed goal by 20 or $25 million. I personally think that is really good news because tobacco-related illness costs us $780 million a year. So um, it's bad for the budget, but long-term it's really good for every, every part of life in New Hampshire. Um, what is next? So the interest and dividends tax last year brought in $184 million. It was 50% ahead of our plan. And we don't just make these numbers up in ways and means. We get advice from the Department of Revenue. Democrats and Republicans work together. I don't know about in the House, but in the Senate, we were unanimous on what we thought. We were conservative. We lowered some of the estimates that the Department of Revenue Administration brought us. The interest and dividends tax just blew off the doors. It is going to be eliminated as of December 31st of this year. So it will be collected really for one more year and then maybe amended returns for a little bit. But that's $184 million that is going to disappear from the general fund with, um, with our biggest tax source, the biggest business taxes underperforming. So that is very concerning to me. Also, um, I just want to point out that the real estate transfer tax is also doing rather badly because there are so few houses for sale in the state. They're very expensive so, um, and they're not, not that many sales. So that is missing um, goal. The um, last thing I point out is when you see other doing well, that it is mostly interest on the state's cash reserves. And again, that was overplanned by tens of millions of dollars because interest rates went up last year and we were spending the ARPA dollars more slowly than we thought. So I'll shut up now and happy to answer questions or at some point. Yeah, or let's whenever. Do Any questions for the senator? What? Joe? <laughs> First hand I saw. Oh, hold on, hold on a minute. You want to do this, George? Thank you. Do we do we have any idea what's causing the um, the fall off in the business tax receipts? Um. Yes, we used to. If you had a net operating loss, you could carry it over for a number of years. And now we limit, and Susan probably knows this better than I do, we limit how, I, how quickly you have to take the refund. So the refunds um, have been higher than expected. That's part of it, but there may be a general softening of the economy that we don't really know yet. We, we do have thousands of jobs open. State government alone has something like a 20% vacancy rate. 14,000 women never went back to work after the pandemic because they can't find childcare. 
So that prevents businesses from being able to grow. But, but a, a big part of it is the refunds. Oh, Carrie, you had a question. Okay. Uh, all right. So I read in the uh, in some of the papers a couple of different things where uh, the attorney general is is involved in all these lawsuits against having to defend the transgender bill that we passed and some other things. And he said he's going to go over the budget that you list here. Where is that money going to come from so that we can go around suing people? Well, so in the state budget, we budget. $350,000 a year for the litigation fund. We spend something over $7 million a year on litigation, but it is, it is a, an ask that the Attorney General is able to come to the fiscal committee and he does a couple times a year, just recently came and asked for, I think it was $6.7 million. And we get, he has to submit an annual report and it's really detailed. So it tells you like, you know, on this case, he spent $23 copying documents. But there are lawsuits that are incredibly expensive, and one that I will mention was Senate Bill 3, which was um, a voter suppression bill that the state kept losing but kept appealing, and we ended up spending four and a half million dollars on that one unconstitutional law. There's a new lawsuit that's just been filed on House Bill 1569, which requires the proof of um, citizenship. Litigation's already been filed on that. And in a lot of cases, they have to hire outside law firms. They don't have the resources internally. So it's possible that we could end up spending millions of dollars on that. I don't know how much we're going to spend on the lawsuit against the, the trans kids playing sports, whether the state's going to keep appealing it or not. But those reports are all online. I mean, all of this is public. Hello. Uh, Hi. My name is Santosh. I'm quite new to the process, so I might ask some basic questions, but I will ask. First thing is, if the budget is going negative in losses, mm -hmm. uh, if basically the cash flow, whatever I see, $27 million in loss right now for one month, right? I'm sorry. I'm I... seeing it right now. Total receipt, actual and the plan is $27.9 million more we spend, right? So are you looking at the current month? I'm rep? looking at the current month, FY25 current month and the plan. So we are supposed to, we are expecting 328 millions. Right. And we, actually and is 328. We missed it by $28 million. Right. For one month. So what we are doing down the line, because business tax is going down, our revenue is coming down. So what we are going to do to control our expenses or how we are going to balance the income uh, revenue versus the uh, revenue versus the expenses. So if this trend continues, um, and we're, you know, currently we have some surplus from the previous fiscal year, but if this trend continues, then um, what generally would happen is the governor would direct agencies to stop spending, and this, we would see effectively budget cuts during the fiscal year. I haven't seen that since 2011, 
but um, that, that is what would happen if this continues. We're okay on the general fund side, but it's the education trust fund where we're not making our goals. Well, it would be, would be the governor, um, and he's in office for two months more, something. I mean, we have not heard any, any hint that he is getting ready to direct agencies to stop spending. The legislature is out of session, so we cannot do that. The new legislature that's gonna be elected on November 5th will be sworn in on December 4th, but doesn't convene until January 5th? Something like that. So, it really is, it's a governor's prerogative, but we've had no indication that he's thinking of directing agencies to stop spending. And this is just one month, and, and I brought it just so that you would see the kind of information you can get online through the Department of Administrative Services. This comes out a few days after the close of every month. And starting in the middle of the month, those of us on finance and ways and means start getting emails with the daily revenues that show us how we're doing versus goal for the month, how we're doing versus previous year, same month, and how we're tracking for the fiscal year total. Okay, our goals, the, um, so you have an actual and you have a plan we just talked about in this for the month of September. And uh, now is the plan reflecting obligations or is the plan, uh, you know, what you m intended to receive for operating expenses or need to receive? The plan does not reflect obligations. It reflects what we expect to happen that month. There are several months in the year where we tend to collect a lot of revenue. September's a reasonably important month. December, I think, is big. March and April are huge. Um, so the plan is just based on prior experience of how much of annual revenue tends to come in in a particular month. We set the annual revenue targets. We don't set the monthly one. The Department of Revenue Administration does that based on past history. Uh, two questions. I am, did I hear you rightly that the legal department does not really effectively budget what it needs? It only budgets 300000 but then it spends millions? Yes. And where do you pocket the money so that you can pay each year for the many millions more than you actually have budgeted? Well, we've been very lucky that we've been running general fund surpluses. I mean, we tend to budget pretty... <coughs> prudently um, and we have always in my 10 12 years on finance I'm not sure long time um, I've been on the fiscal committee for I don't know eight or ten years we have always been running a surplus so it's not been a problem we know we're under budgeting the litigation fund. 
but um, it's a way of not making the budget look bigger because we know that the Attorney General can come in and ask 10 people for general funds. Given how large the business tax is, how did you, or for what reason did you decide that you no longer wanted to have a business tax? The interest and dividends tax. Uh, he, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't un understand your question. No, the interest and dividends tax is being repealed. It won't be collected after December 31st. I don't know why he decided that. He doesn't tell me what he is thinking. Well, the governor proposed it in his budget a few couple of budgets ago, and it's an interesting tax because only about 10% of the people in New Hampshire pay it. And 80% and, um, of the people who pay it pay less than $500 a year. But there are about 20 tax returns, and so I'm gonna be generous and say all these people are married, so there are 40 people in New Hampshire whose tax obligation is greater than $250,000 for this tax. And if you work backwards, that means that their stock dividends are at least $5 million a year. And then if you try to figure out the yield of what that is, I think you can comfortably say we're talking about 40 people who have assets of more than $100 million. But most people, I think, in New Hampshire don't even know this tax exists because they don't pay it. You don't pay it if you get a pension. And there's an exemption. So um, a married couple is they don't have to pay at, unless they make more than $4,800 a year um, in stock dividends and interest. And if you're over 65 and you're, or you're blind, there are further exemptions. So as I say, only about 10% of the people in the state have ever had to pay this tax. But last year it brought in $184 million. I have just a question about that. The 180 million that is not going to be paid anymore by that 40 people is now the problem of the rest of the state to make that up. Is that a correct statement? Yes. I mean, unless there's just organic growth from other revenue sources. But essentially, that puts $184 million a year hole in the budget. Um, I believe the federal government taxes are determined by the legislature, correct? I believe the f in the federal government, taxes are determined by the legislature. They decide how much the income taxes and other kinds by of- By Congress. By Congress, right. Yes. Is that also true in the state? Well, we don't have any other, and we don't have an income tax. No, no, no. The choice to not have the tax that you were just talking about on interest and dividends. Was that determined that? by- the Republican majority. Oh, okay, not the governor. Well, he proposed it. It was supposed to be phased out after over five years, and in the current budget, they decided to just eliminate the last two years. So it was just a, a cliff. Any other questions? Thank you. Well, thank you. 
Okay, I won't go away. Well, I feel like the doom and gloom part of, the, of, of this pairing here because I'm going to be talking about education funding. Education funding is the largest section of our budget, close to it. Second. 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 Yeah. Uh, and there's a problem with that in my mind. but. Uh, I just want to start by reading you a piece from the New Hampshire Constitution uh, that talks about education. And it's quite old, so the language is a bit archaic. But I think it's really important to hear the whole thing. It's from Article 83 in the state constitution. And it reads, knowledge and learning generally diffused through a community being essential to the preservation of a free government and spreading the opportunities and advantages of education through the various parts of the country, being highly conducive to promote this end. It shall be the duty of the legislators and magistrates in all future periods of this government to cherish the interest of literature and the sciences and all seminaries and public schools, provided nevertheless that no money raised by taxation shall ever be granted or applied for the use of schools or institutions of any religious sect or denomination. It's Article 83 of the state constitution. Um, I, I found that really quite remarkable. Well, the courts have interpreted it differently. Yeah. Um, but that's the original language. So the the Courts, the, the Constitution says that we are supposed to be providing a free public education. Um, and at some point, I'd, I'm almost tempted to turn this around, but I don't think any of you can see it. Um, the New, Ham New Hampshire funds public education through three major sources, the federal government, the state government, and local property taxes. Now, the federal government provides about 10% of the costs through services like uh, acts like the Child Nutrition Act for free or reduced lunches, Title I, which is for low-income students, and for the, uh, through the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. And we may lose some of that money because the ARPA funds are expiring, if I remember correctly. In any event, that's about 10% of the current budget. The state, well, let's go to the other end. Local property taxes, the ones that just, if we look at our property tax bills, we are providing about 60% through just our regular property taxes. And then there's another tax. If you look at your property tax bills, it says city, county, and state. The state one is uh, through a tax called SWEPT statewide education property tax. And we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about SWEPT. So I just want to mention that if you look at your, bill, your property tax bills, there are those three pieces. New Hampshire's uh, current public school cost, uh, aid sorry, per pupil is a base of $4,182 with an addition if children need special education services of just over $2,000 and another $800 for students who are English language learners. In other words, they are, their primary language, their first language is not English. Charter school aid is $9,000. They may get some of those add-ons. And education freedom accounts, otherwise known as vouchers, their base is $5,200, which is higher than our public school base. They do not get any of the add-ons, though. 
Um, so we have those three different uh, amounts of money going to different schools. A little bit about EFAs, uh, vouchers. They were approved by the legislature in 2021. They allow families to apply for vouchers, which they can use for private schools or homeschooling. There are no limits on the amount from the, fe from the state government that be can be used. So there is no cap on the total. Most programs that we fund say you get $73 million and that's how much this department can use for that program. With the vouchers, there is no limit. Uh, it was originally uh, assumed the first year that it would cost about $140,000 and we've spent 60 million so far in the last three years. Um, each student receives $5,200 per year. The money is removed from the State Education Trust Fund. That's the big pot that is set aside by the legislature. It is not removed directly from each community's budget. For example, if a student from Nashua gets a voucher, the city's education budget, the, the state aid from this, uh, for the city, is not charged $5,200. It's the entire amount, and then the total number of vouchers is removed from that total amount. The impact on different communities, therefore, is not specifically impacted if that community has a lot more students go, getting vouchers than communities that aren't. Um, students' families can earn no more than 350% of the federal poverty limit, which at this time is just over $109,000 for a family of four. Once students are in the program, they are never means tested again. So if your family this year earns $105,000, but next year your parent or parents get big raises and they're now, the family income is now $120,000, it makes no difference. Once the students are in, they're in, and they can keep going through their high school education. Uh, at least 80%, and depending on the year, at least 80% of students who are receiving vouchers never attended public school. What that means is that communities were not receiving aid for those students, so regardless of how little the amount of money may be deducted from a community, if those students were never in school, in public school, there, is, there was no prior income, so the impact is greater than you might think in that regard. Um, there was a brief audit this summer of, oh, the organization that manages this program is not a state agency. It's the only program that I know, and if you know differently, please share that information. It is the only program that I know where it is a state-funded program over which the state does not have control. The money is funneled through a private company based in New York. They take a 10% cut, and then the funds are distributed to the families to use where they're going to use them. We cannot find out, we can, almost, we can find out almost nothing about where those funds are going or how they're being used. Uh, we don't know if the students should be in the programs. There was an audit, a very brief audit, a short audit this summer of about 50 of the students. We don't know who they were, but about 50 cases were presented by this organization. And out of the 50 students that uh, they offered records on, it was found that 20, not 20%, but 20 of them either lived out of state or had income limits that, or incomes that were higher than the limits that were uh, required. So particularly when you think of students living out of state, that's called fraud. This is supposed to be for New Hampshire students only. Other than that, we have seen nothing and have no control 
as I said, there is no outside limit on how much money can be going into the vouchers. So that's one, yeah, it's fun, isn't it? Um, let me go to the next one. Adequacy aid, and that's what that $4,000 that the state provides is called, is woefully inadequate given how much education costs now. The state average um, is somewhere about $18,000 a year. $4,000, we all know how to do the arithmetic there. It simply doesn't cover the cost of those students. And there, as I said, there is limited federal aid, but all of that difference is covered by property taxes, including SWEPT. Let's talk a little bit about SWEPT. SWEPT was, um, let me just make sure I've got the year correct. SWEPT is a statewide tax that was imposed in 2000, I'm sorry, and sorry, in 1999 is in response to court cases that asked for funding, school funding to be expanded. Um, and I'll get into the court cases in a little bit. What it does is take a look at, it's a state tax imposed, this uh, consistent rate across the state, but it's collected by your city or town and kept in your city or town. The money never goes to the state. It is, however, claimed by the state as part of its contribution to local education. So the, the bill that we are paying out of our property taxes is about 70%, and the state is claiming that 10%, not 10% of that, but 10% as opposed to the other 60% is their contribution, which it is not. Um, the tax total that they are expecting to raise or committed to raise over the course of a year is $363 million. This is the ed what's called the Education Trust Fund. Um, so that's that one. I'm gonna stop. Any questions so far? You know what, let's hold it till the end. George, you're right, thank Are you. Are you gonna talk about the litigation? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of litigation. Um, there's been a bunch of lawsuits uh, brought against the state challenging the formula for raising funds. And one of the problems is that communities where property values are lower have a harder time raising funds than the communities where property values are higher. Think about if the average property in one community is $600,000 and the average property value in another community is $400,000. The only way that the community with the lower property values can raise as much is to have a much higher uh, assessment rate than the wealthier community, which is putting a bigger burden on those who can't afford it. Um, so some of the lawsuits are the first, the earliest one was uh, from Claremont, New Hampshire, which is uh, over on the uh, western side of the state near the Connecticut River. George, I hope you edited out all the ums here, please. Uh, they challenged the state funding rate, saying that they couldn't afford to pay for education. The state said they would increase the rate but never fully funded its promise. And by 1999, Claremont's high school had lost its accreditation because the district couldn't keep up with needed repairs. What do we do now? In 1993, the New Hampshire Supreme Court interpreted that uh, P 
piece of the Constitution that I read to you, uh, saying that students had a right to a public education. In 1997, the, the school funding system was found unconstitutional, and the legislature and governor were ordered to define the components of a constitutionally adequate education, cost them out, and pay for them with taxes that were equal across the state. Four governors and their legislatures refused to comply with the court's orders, leading the Supreme Court to again find the school funding system unconstitutional in September, unconstitutional. Uh, in September 2006, Governor John Lynch tried unsuccessfully to amend the state constitution so that there would not have to be added funding. The court also explicitly held, and this is a quote, to the extent the state relies upon property taxes to fund a constitutionally adequate public education, the tax must be administered in a manner that is equal in valuation and uniform in rate throughout the state. In other words, the same rate had to be applied to communities regardless of the average value of a home. Well. There was more fighting against that. Uh, Republicans argued that the court did not interpret the Constitution correctly in these decisions. And the Constitution merely requires the state to ensure that localities like cities and towns provided an adequate education. So as long as somebody is paying for education, it doesn't have to be us, was the basic message there. Last November, Judge David Ruoff ruled in two cases. In one, uh, Contucook Valley School District, uh, to raise the, the minimum funding level, he ruled in favor of the plaintiffs, saying that the base funding rate was inadequate and should be, in quotes, no less than $7,360 per pupil, and added that the true cost is likely much higher than that which he calculated, and he uh, added that this amount would cause an increase of state funding for education of $537 million. A year. A year. A year. Representing the state, the, uh, one of the assistant attorney generals argued that the statute defining the scope of an adequate education refers to instruction in content areas or academic disciplines and intellectual skills. So we didn't have to fund all of the education. We just had to fund pieces that focused on math or on English. And somebody would figure out how much it cost to cover those things. But we didn't have to cover a whole education. Uh, he also acknowledged that the schools didn't tailor their financial ledgers to assign expenses to content area. The other big uh, lawsuit was relating to SWEPT. When SWEPT was uh, introduced in 1999, receipts in excess of the amount required to fund, let me change this, make it easier. If a community collected more from its tax than it needed to fund its own education, they were required to turn that excess back to the state to be distributed to the other communities so that they could fund proper education for the less well-off communities. Now, there are some wealthy communities, communities that have very few students. Uh, some of them are resort communities that don't have a lot of families living there year-round. Um, so the excess funds would go back to the state to distribute them. These wealthy communities didn't like this idea. They called themselves donor towns. And they formed a coalition to challenge that decision, saying that we should be able to keep our funds. It's our money. We're going to keep it. Um, the courts rejected their efforts to change it. But the legislature overrode the courts and said, we're going to repeal that requirement to return the excess. And the donor communities, the wealthy communities, can keep their money and do whatever they want with it. And we've heard of communities where they've done things like buy a fire truck 
Well, you know, fire trucks are important, but it shouldn't be coming out of education funds. Um, in any event, this lawsuit was to say, we need to do away with SWEPT as it's written and come up with a better way to assess a statewide property tax to fund education. Um, again, the same judge, Judge Ruoff, wrote that communities that do not generate excess SWEP funds use all their funds generated under the fiscal SWEP rate, and the ones that collect more use it for whatever they want. So it's unconstitutional in his mind. Um, and finally, enough with the details here, the state is ap uh, appealing both rulings on the grounds that they violate the state's uh, separation of powers requirements. And therefore, the, the court system does not have any authority to make those decisions. We have a constitution that says education has to be funded, but the state is appealing saying, well, maybe we don't because it's none of the law's business. And I just wrote down final words. Rain flows downhill and so do taxes. The fact that we are not getting adequate funding from the state to cover the cost of educating our children means that we are going to educate our children and the only option left for communities is property taxes. That's why our property taxes are so high. So when your neighbors complain about the, the mayor is raising taxes for, you might want to remind them that the state isn't adequately funding education and we are left holding the bill. Did I get it right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, but we're facing $530 million a year. A year. Potentially of added education cost without a way to pay for that. Questions, yeah. I, I guess it's like we say in the State House, would you believe? <laughs> yes. I have three. So I have three would you believes. One of them is that the voucher program currently allows, has approved Phillips Exeter at $48,000 a year in tuition to receive voucher funds. It makes no sense. Second, <laughs> would you believe? We passed a, uh, a bill was uh, narrowly failed last year that allowed vouchers uh, to all levels of income and narrowly failed. The bill is back. It's, was in, it's in the September sec collection of bills. If, if Arizona is any example, it will break the state if this thing passes. It literally, Arizona is in billions of dollars worth of debt trying to pay for these vouchers, and we're facing the same kind of thing if this thing passes, and who knows what's gonna happen. The, uh, the third, would you believe, is that more than 80% of schools that have been approved for vouchers, and I checked every one of them, are religious schools. So the idea that state funds are not being used for religious schools is, is a total violation in the, in, the, um, in the voucher program, and some of those religious schools are not within the state. So those are my three would you believes, and it's really very, very depressing for me, who was a public education kid from the year one, and, and it's, it's just very disappointing that we don't see the value uh, of what this public education could be and should be. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to focus on that middle comment about uh, the idea of vouchers, th that there's an effort to, to make vouchers open to anybody. A couple of things. The little bit of research that I read has shown that students who get vouchers and use them to go to private schools actually 
do worse on standardized tests than students who go to public schools. And it may be that they're going to schools where they focus on religion rather than academics. Um, I believe, and I, I am not the only one by any means, I believe that part of the, the, the main purpose of the effort to expand the voucher program is to destroy public education and to make it easier for students to be taught only what their families want them to know. That scares me a great deal because we need a common understanding of history, of government, of science, at least have a working knowledge of literature that's shared. And the more we segregate, the easier it becomes to separate into little fiefdoms and see other groups as other rather than another. Um, so, yeah, this worries me a lot, in addition to all the financial implications. Yes, thank you. Susan, could I respectfully ask if you go back towards the beginning of your presentation and you uh, put some numbers out, adequacy of 4182, I think I wrote down. Then you listed some add-ons uh, in the $2,000 range for special yeah. ed and free and reduced ELL, whatever. But then there was a $9,000 number. Um, that's that's, that's and, for I mean, charter just, schools. Okay. The charter schools get 9,000? Yes, public charter schools get 9,000. If they've got a, a child enrolled there that qualifies for a voucher? No, no, this, no. Is, this is state, state aid to public charter schools. Okay, thank you, thank you. Can I add also that charter schools, Wait. I'm sorry, I have a big outdoor voice. But the, the, the camera can't hear you. Um, charter schools don't have to have certified teachers, um, and they can also, they don't have to teach um, founded science. I don't know about that. I do know that private schools and parochial schools, for private and parochial schools, what you have just said is, is true. And certainly for children who are being homeschooled, we don't have any idea of what the people who are doing the homeschooling have in the way of knowledge base, let alone teaching skills. Public charter schools are, uh, they make a contract. The school makes a contract with the community. If the community wants uh, science and ed, science and math to be taught, then that's what they'll have to teach. And they also like what happens in uh, Derry with Pinkerton. If they want a good program, they'll pay for it. It's, so it's, it's very flexible. It's what the community wants and what they will contract for. So it, it, there is some flexibility there and they, there is some control by the locals. But do you know the answer to Linda's question about whether teachers have to be certified? If it's in the, if it's in the contract that they have okay. to be certified. I know with voucher schools in general, they do not. It's yep. like one teacher out of 10 is okay. something like that. Thank you. So if I'm reading this correctly, there's three billion dollars roughly spent on education, or col collected rather, I know spent on education on the first page. That's what, spending. Yeah, what fraction of that is going to vouchers? Is going for what? So we have spent 50 million dollars, I think. 60. 60 in total on this program in the first three years. And we really 
don't have any oversight over it it's not accountable it's not transparent we really don't know what's going on with this sixty million dollars yeah and again it's the only program that I know of in the state where that's the case where we don't have any have a clue um, the charter schools do they have standardized testing as far as I know they don't have to I mean even in public schools parents can uh, refuse to have their children tested. So I think, but I'm not sure, that in charter schools they, are, they can, but they don't have to. And, and please don't quote me on that. It's a think, not a no. no. I have another question. I'm sure Cindy, Cindy is aware of this. I'll hold it as well. Um, years ago, I was absolutely blown out of the water. I received a letter. Uh, stating I was invited to a meeting uh, along with a few neighbors because they were changing the traffic format at the end of my uh, street, which is at the end of the Henry Burke Highway where it abuts uh, Concord Street North. And when I went to the meeting, somebody yelled across the room, hey Annie, take a look at the aerial view the new view doesn't have your house on it. They were going to cut off the end of uh, Gettysburg Drive and the access was coming through the house behind me and my house they were gonna take. Is there any way, is the city aware of these kinds of things so that we can be prepared before being totally blown out of the water by by this kind of presentation. Does the town know about these things before they happen? Or the planning of them? It was a huge plan. You need this they one too. So I remember some years ago, and I thought it was a couple of streets over from you, there was a plan to build a bridge to Hudson and it was going to destroy an entire neighborhood. And um, it was going to be a public-private partnership bridge. And this happened kind of right before Christmas. And um, people in this neighborhood were told, here's what we're going to pay you for your house and you should take it because if you don't take it now, you're probably going to get less later. Yeah. We stopped that, but I don't know if that involved Gettysburg. I thought it was a little bit further well, they were going to north. Come at the end of Gettysburg Drive. They were going to make a circle for that bridge. Yeah, and okay. put the four-lane highway down the power line mm -hmm. through the bridge, but the access to Gettysburg was then cut off. And it was going through Academy Drive, the house behind me, and taking the house behind me and mine. Um, well, we stopped that in the legislature. And um, I think that was in 2009, about. It was a while ago. It was a while ago, but it was really traumatic for a lot of people. They only notified people who where they were taking part of your property. And a lot of my other neighbors who were going to abut the train, they were not invited to the meeting. Wow. Well, we yeah. did stop that project. Yeah. But did the town know about this? Um, or did they know about I'm not sure they really did. I mean, it would have been sort of a state project. It involved both Nashua and Hudson, and I think it was going to be a state project. Yeah. It just, there's Thank nothing about it that, was going to work out well. I mean, the public-private like partnership thing, like we were going to have private companies owning a bridge, 
and they could set a toll on the bridge and they would have complete control over what it would be. I mean, the, the whole thing was just misbegotten. It was scary. It was scary and for some years after that when I used to knock doors um, uh, on some of those streets near you, people were still traumatized mm -hmm. that a stranger was coming to their door because they thought I was coming to tell them the bridge project was back and we were gonna take their house by eminent domain and pay them, you know, something, and they better do it. And it really was several election cycles where people were afraid when I was ringing their doorbells near where you live. Um, how many um, charter schools are there in the state? I've only heard of, in Nashua, I think that, well, I forget the name, is it Nashua Science, Science and Academy? Is that a charter? But uh, Somebody mentioned Pinkerton, is that a charter? No, Pinkerton's not. There's no gym. Oh. No. It started out as a charter school. Yeah. Oh. I, I believe the last I looked there were 53. But I will, again, I think that's what I read, but again, I'm not sure. There were a few in Nashua. Oh, there's a few in there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's the Academy of Science and Design, there's the Micro Society, there's the um, Arts yeah. Charter School, those are the ones I can think of. George, there's a question in the back. Uh, my question is uh, definitely I do not believe in the different sets of education. Education should be same to everyone. Uh, environments also should be same. Standardization should be there. But we have an issue of number of students in the public schools are reducing not just by the charter school, but it's reducing because a lot of young population is not coming to our, uh, our state or uh, Nashua or any other city in the New Hampshire. If number of students in the schools are less, then why the school budgets are going up and up every year? So it should be based on the number of students in the public school. It should be in correlation with our customers or our students. And we should spend according to how many customers we are serving. So. My question is, is there any correlation in that regard from the state? Is there any kind of a guideline to increase the students so that we can spend more on the infrastructure, we can spend more on the programs? Is there any kind of a policy from the state level? Uh, let's, let's start by looking at what happens when school populations drop, and they are dropping all across the state. Yep. Nashua is not alone. It's very rare that when school populations drop, you get, say, the entire, all the students who leave or who aren't coming back or who just aren't enrolling in kindergarten. It's very rare that you're going to get all of the students who are going to be in third grade in the Birch Hill School. It's a student here or a student there, and when you add them all up, the numbers may be significant, but in terms of a given school area, it's going to be very rare that you wind up with even the equivalent of a classroom that is that there, there will not be that many students dropping out from a particular school. Right. So it, it's very difficult to say, well, okay, and I'm just, I live near the Birch Hill School, which is why I'm talking about it, uh, and I am not trying to suggest anything about the Birch Hill School. It has to get to a point where there are enough students in a school at a particular grade level before you can say, eliminate one teaching position. 
you can't eliminate a teaching position if you have four students on one grade level. It becomes difficult then to say, well, we have 5% fewer students, so we need 5% fewer teachers. It, it do, it's, not as, it's not a direct correlation like that. What school districts, and this is something to really take up with the Board of Ed, when school districts look at a budget, they have to look at where are students leaving from? Are there enough students leaving from a given school on a given grade level? Do we see about maybe rearranging district lines? And that's something that they need to work on, but you can't simply say we have 5% fewer students, so we need 5% fewer teachers. It, you, you, it just doesn't work that way. Right. I mean, the costs are really fixed. You still need a building. You still need the school buses. You need to feed the kids. You need water. You need heat. You need insurance. So, I mean, the costs to operate a school district, most of them are, are fixed costs. And so when a child leaves a school system, there's really not any savings because if one kid leaves from the third grade at Mount Pleasant and another kid leaves from the second grade at Birch Hill, there's really no savings there. Uh, you're not getting my question. My question is, do we have any policy in place that, okay, for this level of number of students, this is what the infrastructure we want. If it goes down to a certain level, these are the possible cost cutting we can do. Does any kind of guidelines <coughs> or any kind of rules or regulations something is there in place so we can revisit it every three months or six months to look at it maybe at the district level or maybe somewhere at the top i don't know but if we do not have a certain guidelines we will always keep on not measuring that parameter and we will make a general statement it could be it could be five students it could be seven students but let's have a policy in place that if this thing will happen, this is what the parameter I'm measuring, and this is what the directions we will be taking. If we do not have guidelines in place, we will always be playing a judging game, like, okay, this is yeah. what it could be, and that is not the real situation. And, and that is something that is determined on the district level. Right, each school district could set their own policy. We eliminated 24 teaching we did eliminate um, 24 teaching positions this year due to lower student count. But it's just not a big It's just not a big There are no there are big Right. But, but that is something that the state legislature, if the state legislature tried to put that, set up a regulation for school districts, we would be excoriated. Mm -hmm. That's our district. We make the decisions. Yeah. So the, the group to talk to about that is Nashua's Board of Ed. Only find out yeah. a way to bring more kids to our league. Right. But well, I mean, we want to have more kids here because that means there are more families here yeah. mm -hmm. and more people working here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, there was um, a study actually conducted by UNH a couple of years ago that looked at if you have more children in your school system, does it make your property taxes go up? And the answer was no. And so the corollary is also true, that as there are fewer children in your school district, your property taxes are not going to go down. And that's because the costs are fixed. I, I will give you a very specific example from when I was on the school board in Lexington, Mass. End of the school year, budget all set, number of teachers we needed, and in one school district, within the space of a month, 
five families with, three families with triplets and six families with twins all entering kindergarten. Well, Came into one school district. I mean, we, we, we all went, no, you know, that's ridiculous. How does that happen? And it happened that all the families bought houses in, those, in that one school district. But that is the only kind of situation where you look at, well, we need to have another teacher because, you know, that's another 12 children and we can't distribute them among the two other kindergarten classes because the class will be too big. Likewise, if that many kids left, then you might be able to consider we don't need that kindergarten teacher. But it really needs to be a large group in the same place at the same age before you can say we can eliminate a teaching position in that school at that level. Other questions? Well, we're, next year is going to be a budget year, so we'll be putting That's together. Level, yeah, budget year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll be working on an operating budget and a capital budget, and whoever is elected governor will have priorities, which may or may not be the same as the legislature's priorities. And... So maybe there will be clarity after November 5th. We do know that funding is going to be an issue. If the, the two uh, recent lawsuits were appealed by the state to the state Supreme Court, and if they uh, put out a ruling in favor of the plaintiffs, we're going to have to figure out where another half million, half billion dollars every year is going to come from. So that, that would be one of the things that might come up. And that's not the only litigation we're facing. Mm -hmm. There are these sexual assault yep. lawsuits yep. from the youth detention centers. Some of them are uh, criminals. Some of them are civil. And then there is, we've agreed to it appropriate $75 million a year to settle some of the cases so that the victims don't actually have to go to trial and be traumatized all over again. So we have some potentially really huge expenses in front of us. And diminishing revenues, yeah. Right, because a third of the legislature turns over every two years. Yeah, Sue? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm referring back to Cindy's pie chart here. Uh, I'll just make a comment on with uh, uh, page four, it's the second one in. Within the, on the committee that I've been on for eight years, public works and highways, and this will be a capital budget year going in, and then the next one will be the 10-year transportation plan. But in the Department of Transportation, I have heard for all these years revenues from tolls, revenues from gas tax and whatever, and the reality is over the years, the tolls, the toll booths, we'll see, they, for the most part, they've gone away, you know, and the subsequent has gone away. So there is a Department of Transportation they watch that very carefully. And the gas tax with EVs and hybrid cars not using the gasoline, that's a tax reduction as well. And, and I think what I'm, I, I don't even have a word to describe it, but from all
always got blown up and the can got kicked down the road. I think they are trying seriously to come up with something this year, but I would almost guarantee everybody will not be happy, but there's, it's a revenue thing, and it's going to Well, also, some years ago, we increased the gas tax, but it had a sunset yeah. on it, which is coming up soon. And so the gas tax, unless it's extended, will decrease, and those revenues will decline even further. But you're right, with people driving more fuel-efficient cars, our gas tax, the, it's called the road, road toll. Mm -hmm. Those revenues have um, not been growing. We like it when beautiful fall and tourists come into the state and buy gas. Oh. But there, there was a bill, I think in 2023, to have a $100 surcharge we on electric that. vehicles. We, we didn't. We did as part of the budget. But it didn't go through. No, it did. Anybody drive an EV? Because I, I haven't heard anybody being charged. Anyway, it, it, I don't think, think so. so. I, I, okay. I would just say the things that I'm familiar with is, yes, a surcharge and registration time if you have an EV. Okay. Any last questions? Thank you all for coming, and thank you for your questions. They were really, yeah. really.